It, oh, look, I can finally add a member, Scott. It only took <laughs> three minutes for a list of my members to load. So I can add you to my super special podcast security group. Because do you know why you need to be in my podcast security group? Uh, mm, I, I wouldn't know why I need to be in a podcast <laughs> security group had I not spent 30 minutes talking to you about all the other issues I was having before we hit the record button. So why don't we, yeah, tell me why you're adding me to the podcast security group. So I can get you access to loop in my tenant. Not that you didn't already have access to it, but I put podcast notes in there because we wanted to try this, and we figured that Loop is in public preview today, or I figured. I don't know that I ever consulted you on this. <laughs> I figured since Loop is in public preview, and I've been having a plethora of conversations about it with different people and playing with it, that we should talk about it today. But you can now get to my podcast notes because you got the infamous error message of Loop has not been enabled for your organization. I don't know that I did get the error message though. So, uh, well, when you first I, I, opened I'm gonna it, go you did back to customer feedback here, right? Okay. So, uh, there's a blog post from Microsoft that says, "Hey, Loop is out. The app is in public preview. I have a lot of arguments about the whole like app when it's really just the website and there's not an app thing, but whatever. So fine. I go to loop.microsoft.com and I get a nice air message that says the Loop app is not enabled in your organization. Loop must be enabled by your admin to log in and collaborate with your organization. And then it's just got a sign out button. Fairly like bland page. I'll put a screenshot into the show show notes for everybody. But the interesting thing is I did get an email like way prior to this. So on Wednesday this week, when you set all this stuff up, I got a nice email that said, Hey Scott, you've been looped in. Ben has invited you to collab in their workspace and it's got this nice join workspace button. So a, a prior to this, I had not gone to just the loop.microsoft.com homepage and seen the like, hey, you're not enabled message. All I did yep. was click the join workspace button inside that email. And that takes me to a wonderfully uninformative and just poor user experience in that you end up on a screen with an animated GIF of a little spinny purple circle with absolutely zero feedback. The page never times out, like doesn't do anything. I've been sitting on this page for 35 minutes right. and I, there's, there's no content here. Right? Like it's, it's, it's just a little spinny circle, even though, uh, I have been looped in. Apparently I am actually looped out. And out. now that you've added me into that security group, we can do some real time testing. We'll see if it's updated by, uh, the time we hit stop on this recording, but I can tell you that no matter how many times I hit refresh over here, uh, it still says that I'm not enabled for it still. So is it a circle or is it a loop, Scott? I feel like the puns with loop can be endless, like it's a loop. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I have to see if I can do like a, a little screen recording of it or something, but it is, uh, I, I don't know. Like this is just, it's, it's not fun, you know? Yeah. So, and we can go back. So what ended up happening and why you were not, why you got looped in, but couldn't access it is, the functionality of being blocked is actually by design. So some of these blog posts, and we can link to it where it talks about this in um, some of these release notes that came out the last week and blog posts, is by default, the Loop app is disabled for organizations uh, because they have not sorted out all of the compliance uh, things, the compliance -y stuff with Loop yet. So they don't want organizations or people in organizations to go in and start using Loop all of a sudden and all of a sudden start having uh, compliance violations because Loop does not have all those compliancy things in place. Ergo, you need to go enable it first by heading over to your off. Is it the Office Configuration Manager, the Microsoft 365 Apps 
Admin Center and going under your customization in the Admin Center and Policy Management and then creating a new policy in there. So within that policy manager, you go, it's pretty simple. So you give it a name, you give it a scope, which has to be a security group, by the way. No Microsoft 365 groups, no distribution groups. <laughs> has to be a security group. Um, Brilliant. Yes, I have tried all the groups. Has to be a security group. And then within security group, there is like your different policies that you can assign. And there are 2,202 different policies available. But if you search for loop, there's only three of them. Uh, create and view loop files in Outlook, which I believe by default this one works in this enabled. There is create and view loop files in Microsoft apps that support loop. Um, I think this one's like for Teams and Word and some of those where we've been able to do loop components for a little while now. And then there is create and view loop files in loop. And that one must be enabled and a security group that you are a member of must be assigned to the scope of this policy. And then once you're in a security group with this policy assigned that has that create and view loop files and loop enabled, you will no longer get the error message about uh, your organization has not enabled loop. Yeah, I, I wonder how long, how long it, takes. it takes for changes to propagate through. So, uh, interestingly enough, there's an article on Tech Community. I don't know that I found one on Docs for this, uh, but it, it talks about kind of service requirements. Hey, enable your firewall. Uh, it certainly talks about the group thing as well. Funny enough, they mention you should use dynamic groups, like create an all users dynamic group. Great idea. Uh, that requires some additional licensing as well <laughs> you're, you're into <laughs> yes. ad p1 p2 territory so you know let, let's go ahead and spend a little bit more money to use loop i get it uh but you create that cloud policy it's buried in the notes over here but there's a little itty bitty line like in hey uh you know step one do this step two step two do this step three do this step three is wait an hour or so for the setting to propagate <laughs> before you go ahead and attempt to log into loop. So uh, your mileage may vary with getting this all turned on and, and where it needs to be. And how quick it actually works. So I am not going to hold my breath then or take any bets that you're going to actually get access to the loop app before the podcast is over. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe because it's only a security group. I'm going to sit over here and keep hitting refresh and sign out, sign in. So uh, I'm going to be looking down a whole bunch while I go to ye old authenticator app over here and, uh, <laughs> and try, try and make try. this crazy set of things. Yeah, I, wanna, I would like yeah. to try Face ID again. Yes, send it to my authenticator app. There's my number, which happens. I typed wrong. So this was interesting. And while you type this in, it came out a couple days ago. Today's Friday the 24th. I think this was announced to public preview on the 22nd of this month. And I've been playing with it for a couple days now. And I've had a few thoughts. One is on how people are comparing this to other products that are in the marketplace. But then I have also kind of been fiddling around and diving into some of the architecture and how this actually appears to be working and how the architecture is the way it is and how some of that's impacted the employee experience. And actually was having a conversation last night on Twitter with someone from the Loop team. I kind of put out a, hey, these are a couple things I've noticed that I'd really like to see fixed. And was having a chat with Shane Chisholm, I think is how you pronounce his name, builder, leading product manager for the Microsoft Loop app, um, about some of what I was seeing and some bugs that, again, are in preview. I would... I will say that as I've talked, some people are like, we all have to remember that this is preview. Some of the stuff will get fixed. 
Um, but where do you want to start with this? Do you want to start with some of the architecture <laughs> or uh, some of the user experience or some of how both of those were impacted in what I saw? Well, from, from what I've seen so far, the architecture is the loop logo, a big plus symbol, <laughs> a SharePoint symbol equals heart with stars. A heart uh, symbol? And, <laughs> oh, a heart with... <laughs> Uh, and, and Loop loves SharePoint. I I know, and 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 really, that's that's about all I've seen so far out of out of Loop. It it is interesting. So I uh, you know architecturally, it's kind of all over the place. I have to say, I'm very confused just in in general about how. I'm supposed to think about the flow of these things and how it's all supposed to come together. So, uh, you know, I, I really wouldn't be playing with this stuff if you weren't encouraging me to do it. But you've been coming and poking at me and saying like, hey, have you tried that? Have you tried that? So uh, something I wanted to do yesterday. So I need to go out to the team and I want to okay. make a big list. Like I need to collect a list of all the dashboards that we have out there. So all of us are product owners for specific things. And we all build these Power BI dashboards and spreadsheets that auto-populate and things like that that show you like adoption of a feature. But we don't have an Uber dashboard that rolls it all up. So what I would like to do is have like, the compendium of dashboards. So I need basically a table. I mean, I could have done this in a spreadsheet, but I was like, why not do it in loop? It'll be kind of cool, right? So I went into Outlook and I created a new loop component. I got a button in Outlook that says insert loop component. I inserted a table. I added some columns to it. And then I went to go send the email. I was like, oh, uh, all right, this all looks good. I've got the loop component there. It's all ready to go. Um, let me see if I can just take that component and embed it other places. And I, I was thinking, you know, if it's in Outlook, it's got to be available in the rest of the ecosystem. It should be in Word and PowerPoint and uh, certainly places like OneNote, which is really what I wanted to do was go over to our big group OneNote and also insert the same dynamic table there. Like, let's have this living construct. And then I quickly got disappointed in that the, uh, the, OneNote, <laughs> both the web client and the desktop client, don't allow you to insert loop components. But then it kind of dawned on me, I was like, when I added the loop component into Outlook, it created a new component. It didn't give me an option to select an existing component at all. So I went back to Outlook and I was like, all right, I have this draft email. I'm just going to delete the draft and start over because I've already got the table that I started creating and it's got my dashboards in it as kind of like a guide for everybody else. Yep. So I said, okay, I'm going to create a new email because maybe I just missed the button up there or something was missing. Went to, you know, insert loop component and I inserted a new table. And I was, like, table. I was like, uh, well, how do I get to the old table? So I went and looked for the old table because I know it's in my OneDrive. So uh, I went and found it in my OneDrive in the attachments folder. And uh, now I've got loop component dot fluid and loop component one dot fluid. Totally helpful, right? Those, those let me know what they are. So I clicked on each one. It turns out there's another app inside your OneDrive that you end up that's just called Loop. It's not loop.microsoft.com. It's just like a little mini Loop app. Uh, but it can display your Loop component in your OneDrive. So it's like, okay, well, that's good. So now I want to take that Loop component and re-embed it. How do I do that? There's no way that I found to do it. All you can do is put like a hyperlink to loop component fluid back into the new email. Uh, and at that point, I got so frustrated, I banged my head against the wall and gave up and came to you. And you said, yeah, you can't do that. But here's all of my problems. So let's go through all of your problems. <laughs> <laughs> so talking to your pro problems, your issue, I would agree with that whole issue and it being a challenge right now. A challenge, an issue, something that I hope gets fixed. Um, and it remains everywhere yet. Uh, that really when you start trying to insert loop components, work with loop components across these different platforms, I have not found a way to do what you're asking about either, um, where it's like embedding it because going back to some of the architecture, really each of these loop components, loop pages, to me, it's still a little confusing about 
when you have a loop component versus when you have a loop page and what the difference between them are. Um, like a component is technically part of a page, but you can also kind of treat a page as a component because at the end of the day, all these things are just dot .fluid files, um, to your point, that you can link to. And even when you're inside the loop app, and if I go to share and like share a loop component and it's embed provide access to this page and support in Microsoft 365 apps, it is actually the SharePoint sharing dialog box that you get where it's like, do you, what sharing settings do you want? Anyone, people within your organization, people with existing access, specific people. And it is a SharePoint URL. Um, for me, it's intelligent.sharepoint.com and uh, the URL and IDs and all of those that you can then go paste wherever you want to. And even within the loop app itself, it doesn't appear that you can like re-embed those components from other places. It's exactly what you said. It's a link to a fluid file that then goes and opens up in a browser. Yeah, it's um, um, it's 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 strange. Uh, I I think there's a lot of things that and and I totally get preview, but uh, being billed as the kind of write once use anywhere component. It's just, it, it's not that thing. Uh, and it's also unclear what other parts of the ecosystem. So so you mentioned kind of being on Twitter and having a, a Twitter thread going. Uh, it, you know, one of the things that I saw you chatting about in, in a thread with a couple folks was, uh, is it possible to embed a loop component in a SharePoint page? Uh, and if not, when will such a thing be possible? Like, I, I, pretty natural thing to say, right? Like, especially because we're driven so much into the web apps and a fluid file is just a uh, a web rendering thing, right? Granted, it ren renders within the embed and, and the context of the, the loop app and it knows how to do all that. But uh, yeah, it's it seems like an interesting gap. Uh, and and uh, maybe I'm being too harsh or like, I, I just, I, I can't like, figure out like why the gaps are there that are there. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the more well, I look at it, I'm like, Oh, you kick the tires. They, they really like <laughs> they're rough. You're going to hurt your toe pretty quick. So it did just work, Scott. I will say I have this up in front of me and I have a loop page open for the podcast and I put a table in it. And then as an option there, there is a essentially create this table as a component. Component and it did let me copy the component. And I took that copy and pasted that component into our Microsoft Teams chat that we have for the podcast recording. And it did let me paste it and re embed it within Teams. So, but you had to start from a component that was created in the loop app in a page, in app not itself. a component that was created from Outlook or from Word or from another place first. Right. Like, I don't know, because, and you can even see it too. It looks like you see the component in our Teams chat, is when you go now for this component, um, the only thing you have is to copy the link. And I don't know that if you copy this link into an email or anything like that, that it actually lets you do an embed there. Um, and I do agree with you. I want to see this come to more places like a SharePoint page. Um, I would like to see this come to OneNote. Although I will also say I'm a little confused now about when I should use Loop versus when I should use OneNote because they're also does seem to be some storage overlap. Oh, it worked, Scott. I actually copied and pasted. Now, given maybe this is because it all started in a loop, in the loop app, I could actually copy and paste that component now from Teams into uh, Outlook on the web, paste it into Outlook on the web, and... I, I, could, I could not. Did so render. all I can do is copy the link. So if I copied that link, so copy that link, pop open OWA, and paste the link in a new email in OWA. Yep. Uh, so I will do that, and I will show you exactly what it did, which is it inserted a link to the web app. 
or to the component, to the dot .fluid file. That is fascinating. So here's what it did for me and <laughs> OA. I just sent you my screenshot of OA, and I actually have the table in my draft message. So maybe this is one of those that is slowly rolling out for different people. Maybe it's because you don't have a policy at my tenant. Maybe it has something to do with that tenant policy as well. It might. Uh, yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting so, one. So the other thing I think about here is uh, how much are people going to be burdened? Like, what's the cognitive load for a user with things like access requests now and all that good stuff? Like, if I'm allowed to just take a link to a loop component and go and throw it in a random email, <laughs> who has yeah. access to that? It, access review is going to be kind of crazy. Uh Beyond that, can we talk about, can we we take a step back? So uh, I've got this link. So you're able to copy the link and embed a table. I'm not able to do that. All I can do is copy a link and embed a link. That's fine. But the link is to a site collection called contents, content storage. Oh, yeah. Forward slash CSP underscore GUID. Uh, how would you even manage access to that? That's like a fake site collection that's hosted and managed on behalf of you in your tenant. In your tenant. So, yes. And this is the other part of the architecture. And this is the conversation that I started having yesterday with the Loop team. Um, Because you noticed it in that link. But I first started noticing these when I would go visit my... I was on portal.office.com and visiting just the normal office landing page and went over to my content. I can't remember if I got there from SharePoint or if I went over to OneDrive and went to my content. But different places within SharePoint and OneDrive now, I actually started seeing all of these different loop components because now these are technically SharePoint files. Um, So when you start looking at quick access and recent activity, uh, all of these were showing up. But then when I went over to my content and started looking at like my cloud files, uh, up at the top of my cloud files, I started seeing all these CSP GUIDs all over cloud files. So it is every time you create a workspace within Loop. So you have workspaces within workspaces. You have pages within pages. You can have components. Um, A workspace gets a new site collection in this. If you're a longtime SharePoint person, the what what did you say? Content storage. It's essentially in the content storage managed path and then a CSP site collection. Uh, apparently, you are not supposed to see these showing up in cloud files and recent activity and all of those. Uh, this <laughs> is one thing after this conversation on Twitter, I was a little perturbed when this was showing up everywhere. Because if you click on one of these, you get access denied. Like, there's no way to get into it. There's no way to manage it. It's this essentially super secret site collection that has all of these loop components for these files. Uh, It also means, Scott, that a loop workspace is not associated with a team or a group from a security perspective. It's its own standalone thing. Um, The loop team is working on hiding those, but it does bring up that point. And I would be on the same page with them. I think they should be hidden. Um, If this is the way they're going to do it, that URL, those site collections, should not show up anywhere because you should not be touching them, messing with them, accessing them, etc. But I'm also assuming that this is now going to start counting against your SharePoint site storage quota. Uh, you would think it has to, right? Because it's in the right, same it's in your tenant. tenant. Yeah, it is. Like mine is at intelligent.sharepoint.com slash storage content slash CSP, whatever. So it is going to count against that. The other thing, and Erica uh, Telly, who we've had on the podcast before, compliance at Microsoft, um, she jumped into this Twitter conversation and she's like, 
this is a compliance nightmare. Um, <laughs> it's not be- pretty. <laughs> Right, because now you start thinking about like what the compliance team is doing with uh, purview and information protection and DLP and all of that. If people start putting, and this is probably why you do have to turn it on, and they did give that, hey, this there's some compliance stuff you have to figure out. If you're starting to put sensitive information in these loop files, someone types a credit card number in there, or somebody types bank account information in there, uh, patient information that would cause HIPAA stuff. Now do you need information protection, DLP, all of that, and purview and compliance to start scanning these super secret site collections that technically you don't really have access to? It's like, I see her point where all of a sudden all this stuff, it's like, well, how is all this going to work together then? Yeah. Uh, you don't have access to, nor can you grant yourself access to, I think is like an, an important no. call out there. Yeah. You can't like do an access request. You can't yeah. find it in central admin. Like you don't have access. I don't know who has access to it. I don't know who the site collection owner is. Um, I haven't tried. So remember, how much did you do with the content type hub? I'm going to so end up breaking something. <laughs> did you do stuff with the content type hub in uh, Fairpoint Online? Uh, I have, but it has definitely been a hot minute. (laughs) So when that first came out, it had this very similar issue where it was like only the person that created the tenant itself had access to Mm -hmm. the content type hub. But you as a global admin could run some PowerShell to go grant yourself site collection owner rights because as a global admin, you were a site collection. It was like a weird security glitch. I wonder if you tried to go find that PowerShell that you used to have to run for the content type hub and share up in a line and ran that against one of these CSP sites. If you could, as a global admin, grant yourself site collection and admin rights on one. I did not say that out loud and nobody go try that, please. And if you do, do not hold me liable because I have no idea what would happen nor if you should even attempt that. Uh, you know, just, just for the sake of science, I'll put in some links to some old blog posts from 2020. If anybody wants to try it out and let us know how it goes. (laughs) Uh, Oh, this could be dangerous. Um, Uh, but yeah, and there's other places it shows up too. Again, because these are recent files, if you go look in your cloud files, it gives you the page name. So I have a whole bunch of mine, like, because I had to try and email with loop components, because that's what I apparently named this loop component, or episode 327, or episodes, or meeting notes, or all of those. But then underneath it, it actually gives that site collection name too. It says CSP underscore AF518 218, blah, 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 blah. It's, um, it's weird the way they get named. Uh, and, and I understand, you know, I think we talked about this like last week or the week before. It's a little bit of like uh, uh, just a timing issue for what you do things, right? Like back to you create your loop component in Outlook, it's always going to be loop component one, loop component two, loop component three. But if I insert a table for a loop component and I give that table a title, which you're able to do as part of the component... Like, I don't know, it almost feels like it should go back and rename it in my OneDrive so I can figure out what it is later, but I I, I don't know. It's it's not a fire and forget kind of thing, uh, but it, it sure makes it hard. The, the other thing yeah. I noticed is uh, back to your whole, like, peri- proliferation of content and, and are you managing it, are you consuming space for no reason kind of thing, Uh the other thing I've noticed with these is when you delete things, like and, and not delete them, but say uh, you know you're in Word or you're in Outlook, whatever it is, you insert that component and then you remove the component. It doesn't actually go back and delete it. It leaves the component sitting there, like in the case of OneDrive, in your OneDrive. In your so OneDrive. you have to go back and find it and rationalize later, like, oh, did I actually need that? Did I mean to have that? What is that thing? What happens if I go back and find it later and I delete it? What else do I break? (laughs) Right. Which I think I'm going to keep talking about compliance because it popped into my head. I think that brings up another compliance aspect, right? Because now with e-discovery, 
if you have a loop component in an email and you have retention policies on emails, but you create a loop component as part of the email and embed it in the email, should that have the same retention policy as the email and be linked to the email the entire time? One or would think, is that right? treated as a separate entity? <laughs> but now it's an email and it's a loop component in a OneDrive or you created a loop component in a workspace in a page and then did what I did where I copied the component into the email. So now the loop component doesn't live in OneDrive. The loop component lives in the super secret site collection, but it's associated with an email, which in theory could have a retention policy on it, along with team chats, <laughs> Word documents, etc. You are um, about to so make a does... lawyer somewhere like very happy, right? There's a lawyer who's I having am. a heart attack, and there's another one who's about to have a field day. Like, oh my gosh, think of all the things that'll go wrong with this and all the fun yeah. we'll have with e-discovery and forcing people into weird places. Yeah, so... And it's weird. And I think that that is something else that came up in that Twitter conversation is people were also asking, okay, if these loop components are created in OneDrive, if a user leaves and their license goes away, all these loop components go away as well with that user that maybe could be collaborating around in all these other places. Um, I would say yes, but it's not a whole lot different than Office files when it comes to the OneDrive versus SharePoint ownership. In my opinion, you could do the same thing with a Word file. Create it in OneDrive, share it out to everybody. You leave, it gets deleted. Um, I am happy to see that my workspaces and all of that that I create in the Loop app don't go into my OneDrive. They do go into a site collection apart from me so that if my account gets disabled, my OneDrive gets deleted, all these workspaces in the Loop app uh, should remain. But it is going back to that same cognitive load you do have now with Office apps is when does this Loop page or this Loop component belong in a uh, workspace versus when does it belong in my OneDrive and being cognizant of where you create it originally, regardless of where it ends up being pasted and shared, is where that loop component is going to remain the for the entirety of its life. Um, yeah, it's 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 tough. <laughs> it's going to be fascinating. So, and then I have one more. I could keep talking about this for a while. I've spent a lot of time playing with this. So All here's right, the other uh, let's, thing let's I discovered. Let's do one more. You've spent one more time more? in the Loop app than I have. I've I've spent a whole bunch of time with it in the Office clients, uh, particularly Outlook, and it's just it's it's been a it's it's been a weird ride. Okay, so here's a fun one, Scott. If you go into the Loop app, or technically, I think maybe if you do this in Outlook, I haven't tried this in Outlook yet, and you do a whack task or a slash task and create a task list. And then in this task list, I can go start typing in tasks. You can do assignees. You can select due dates, all of that um, within this page. And then you're just happening to work around the rest of Office and you meander over to Microsoft Planner. Guess what I saw? <laughs> uh, when is a planner plan not a planner plan? Or when is a planner plan just a set of individual tasks, which then gets manifested as 20 different planner plans? When a planner plan is created via embedded tasks in a loop page. When um, a mommy planner get. plan and a daddy planner plan. like <laughs> It's one of those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get a new planner plan. Um, I am now up to like six new planner plans in the last two days because I keep embedding task lists in my loop pages. Um, so uh, just, just to dial that back page. so everybody understands it. When you create a task list in a loop page, that is creating a brand new planner plan every single time under the hood. And then those planner plans tell folks how they're named. With the name of the page. So there is now a new planner plan. This is my new task in my planner, in my tenant, and my tenant being the intelligent one, that is called Episode 327 Loop is Available. 
because I embedded a task list in here. So I did this the other day where I actually created meeting notes for all of my meetings. And they were all different clients. They were in different workspaces. So I just did meeting notes 2023-03-23 for the date. Um, they're in the workspace. I don't care if the client name is in it. I don't want to put the client name in it. But now I had like six different planner plans, one for every single meeting that were all named meeting notes dash 2023. I had no idea which one they went to. Um, I will say I am reverting my... I was like, this is going to cause a nightmare. Um, I don't know how I'm going to handle all of this because I'm going to end up with a million planner plans. If I actually have planner plans I want to see, they're going to get lost in all these other planner plans. Um, and this was some feedback. This is not a bug. This was by design. But I did give the loop team via Twitter feedback. I'm like, you got to hide all these planner plans um, because you can't do this. Like It's going to mess it up. And they could get away with doing it. So... Originally, I was like, well, I think I kind of want the planner plans because I want to be able to manage tasks, but I feel like I'd want a planner plan for workspace, or I'd want to be able to pick where these tasks go in the planner plan. And as I dug into this, the planner plans are actually used as a bit of a just similar to how SharePoint's used. It's used as a storage location because they could. But you don't need access to Planner to do anything with these. Um, so when you create these, it creates the Planner plan. And to be fair, I think if you went into these Planner plans and started messing with the Planner plans themselves, like adding buckets and tweaking permissions and all of that, you may actually break your loop tasks. Well, it's a little bit of that disconnect and experience in that there's right. the manage path with the site collections that you can't get to. And then there are planner plans, which you can get to. Like maybe those just which need you, to be masked and, right. and kind of hidden which, away in a hosted on behalf of kind of model, right? Like where you don't and see that's them. that's exactly. And that's exactly what they end up doing. Because if you go into, so leveraging tasks in Teams in to-do these will end up getting surfaced. So once a task is assigned to me in loop, in this embedded task list, it shows up as tasks that are assigned to me, uh, both in Microsoft To Do, as well as in, I don't know where my To Do app went, I had it up, as well as in my tasks and teams. And the interesting thing is, is that as you start navigating around between tasks and teams and between Microsoft To Do, it never sends you back to the planner plan. It does have that recognition that, oh, this task. So if I go look at the task that I just assigned to myself, it actually says, this is my new task. You have your whole due date and all of that. Um, it links to the plan where it says episode 327 loop is available. So it, has the plan name in there, but if you click on the link, it doesn't take you to the plan. It takes you straight to the task within the plan and it just pops up an overlay. Um, but really the big link there that it shows if you want to open it up is um, open it in Teams. And it takes you over to the tasks and Teams and opens it up as a pop-up over there. So you can manage all of these tasks within this embedded task list. Um, without ever having to go to the planner plan. So they could absolutely just mask these, hide these, get these removed from the planner interface and let you manage them in to-do within tasks and teams, within your loop component itself to a certain extent. Um, so I'm not as frustrated as I originally was with how it works with planner, as long as they can just go in and just hide all these planner plans because you really don't need access to them. Um, and this Hopefully is weird, it gets Scott. Cleaned, it cleaned up over time. <laughs> I have that component that you're editing open in like three different windows between Teams and Loop and Outlook, and I see you typing in all three windows simultaneously. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I I still can't get into the Loop app, but I've, I've been over here kind of clicking around as well. So I, I was able to... Uh, 
remember earlier when I said when I copied the link and put it in an email, it, it embedded as a, a link. So yep. I can't get to that site collection or anything like that, but I can get to that link. Interestingly enough, that link redirects over to loop.microsoft.com and I actually end up on a page and I'm able to manipulate everything on that page, not just the loop component itself. Interesting. So, and I, well, and I guess from a certain extent, it does make sense because you can't do permissions at a component. Permissions are either a workspace or a page. And this is why, well, the whole SharePoint thing and planner thing is weird. I also understand this is why they had to do it, right? Because if I'm doing permissions at a page level with an embedded task list, and I don't want to give people access to all of the other pages, I couldn't do a planner plan for the workspace. Otherwise, they'd have access to all the tasks from mm -hmm. all the pages in the entire workspace. So because you're having to permission things down to the page level, from the task perspective, you absolutely need to do a planner plan plan for every page in order to um, do security the right way. What I haven't tried, can't do a task list in a component, Scott. You got to go outside of your component. I am outside the component. I'm on a page. No, you're in a component. That little embedded thing there is a component. We should do a YouTube video on this too. No, I'm, um, I haven't I'm, tried I'm, adding two task lists. No, do it up there. See where I just added that new task list? No, I'm um, actually on the page. You you don't understand. I, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do this one. Like, okay, so you are not on the page. You are on a subset of the page. According to Loop, I am on the page. It's I I, okay. am on, I was able to according, set a title for the page. I was able to update the cover for the page. I was able to set an set icon the for the page. To? Is huh? your page title what if a page wasn't a page? Yes. That's not on mine, it's not oh, no. a page. No, uh my title is when is a page a page? And then the text is what oh. if a page wasn't a page? I don't Here, see I'll... the title. That's because you're not on the page. <laughs> Here, hold on, I'll give you a link. What happens <laughs> if you go to that monstrosity? Okay, here, I'm putting a link in the Discord. For those of you that are in Discord and you want to go see this, I'm going to show you where Scott's page is and what my page actually is. Uh, because this is fascinating how this is working. So essentially, it turned a component on my page into a page for you. Yes. So we have embedded pages. <laughs> uh, yeah, here, hold on. I'll, 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 um, I'll put a screenshot in there for you, too. Uh Anywho, oh, come no. along and follow yeah. us in Discord. Okay. It's it, it, it's it's fun. You can generate it's great fun. <laughs> so this right here is Scott's page. Okay, I will put this in Discord. We'll have to figure out how to get this in the show notes or things so other people can see it too. Um, there, there is Scott's page. Scott's page, my page, and Scott's page. Are not the same pages, but Scott's page <laughs> is a sub page of my page. Uh, it's um, absolutely brilliant. I love it. Yeah, this is going to be fun and interesting. So uh, that's some of the architecture, some of what I found. Uh, other people have asked, like versioning, backup, restore. I mean, I don't know how that's going to work. Versioning, they do have it in the page. So I can go to like the page options and see a version history um, of the page. Backup and restore. I don't know because you can't get to the site collection. You can't do like a point in time restore, but also because nobody can get to it. I don't know. I don't know how backup and restore will end up working with loop components. Um, I mean, they're files, so you should be able to do a backup and restore, but it appears that nobody can actually get to the site collection to do a backup of it. Um, it'll be fascinating, but it has been interesting to play with. Um, I feel like this is much more of a... I've used Confluence. I've used Notion. I've now used Loop. I feel like this is very... If you're looking for a product to compare to, I would compare it more to Confluence than Notion. Yeah, um, it, it's it's like Wiki Plus kind of thing. It's, it's definitely interesting. 
Um, yeah, it just doesn't. It, it doesn't have the database components of Notion. Uh, it doesn't have the wiki esque concepts of Confluence uh, or Confluent Confluence. Uh, but it, it's got the fluidity there of like one of those kind of mass content systems like that. Uh, but yep. it's all like individual fluidity. It's not the <laughs> it's not the greater good kind of fluidity that maybe you get out of something uh, like a you can't use, So We'll see. You can use markdown ish stuff as you type. Like you can do a single pound and then start typing for a header or two pound signs or hashtags or whatever you want to call it based on your generation and if they were pound signs on a phone or hashtags in a Twitter post. Um but it's been interesting. It'll definitely be interesting to play with it. We'll drop some show no- or some links in the show notes to some of the Twitter conversations. There were um, a few people that came out with some various videos on the Microsoft Loop app. Daryl, uh, I don't know his last name. It's Daryl as a service. Kevin, um, Kevin uh, Stra, yeah, him. Kevin Stravert. It's not Stravert. Who is it? I can't. I'm, I'm blanking I'm not good on his with last names. name. It's uh, Kevin, yeah. and then there's a Microsoft Mechanics one on it as well. Um, Stratbert, Kevin Stratbert, who has done a bunch of uh, YouTube videos and different Office things. So, a few YouTube videos if you want to go check out some other people's opinions on it. Uh, I'm sure we will be back with more as this goes through the preview process and gets into GA. Um, and I have found that the Loop team is pretty open to feedback. Um, I've mentioned them on Twitter, just at Microsoft Loop. And that's how the conversation the other day started about some of the stuff I was seeing in planner plans and feeling like some of that should be hidden. So um, they're taking feedback, what people think, changes, bugs, issues you find. Um, but lots more we could dive into as well, Scott. So for now, though. I have a camping trip to go on. All right. In this 90 degree Florida trip. weather. <laughs> it's not 90 yet. It's only 80 today. Tomorrow it's 90. Uh, yeah. See, 90 degree weather. At least it'll be cool ish to sleep, like down in the 60s. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, as always, thank you, Ben. Much appreciated. All right. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next week.